She's the live, do you want the, the these ones removed now for the people in the live stream? They're just going to stand and watch you speak, yeah? So we're going to go through each of the slides in turn. Oh, they're going to so go through each of the slides in turn. Yeah. And then after that, that's what they're going to do. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How lovely to see you at Hackney Libraries and Hackney Museum. Um, my name is Sita Brahmachari. I'm Sophia Ahmed. And we have written stories which are set in your community. And you can actually go to the house that is in both of our stories. Not only that, you can go downstairs to the museum and you can see a whole exhibition about the Ayers who are in both of our stories. <coughs> My story is called When Secrets Set Sail. And it's so lovely to see you with it today. And it's a very special day for Sophia today. Because my book, which is called Searching for Jamila, uh, we're going to hand these out so you'll have a closer look at them, um, is being released today. So today's publication day. Um, <laughs> and uh, each of you will be receiving a copy of the book as well as a gift. And they'll come to your school a bit later on. Um, but I'll be talking about this book here, Searching for Jamila which is about three young children, Alex, Matt, and Alex is still easy, um, and they're Aya. They love the music. Yeah, that's right. So we, we have both been really, really drawn to talk about the Ayas. And in my story, When Secrets Set Sail, there are three children, Imtias, Usha, and Cosmo, who doesn't live in the house, but he's part of this community. He lives on a barge. Um, and they are in the actual house where the Ayas used to live. Now, when I was a young person, I used to go to certain places and I used to like feel the atmosphere of the places. When I went to see this Ayers home, the actual house where the Ayers used to live, I could kind of feel the atmosphere. And so I started to write a ghost story. Um, and this wallpaper here is actually in my story. And I think it's also in Sophia's story too. So the children who are here with us today live can actually walk down Mayor Street after this session and after they've read both of our books and they can go and stand on the actual steps of the home where the Ayers used to live. During this presentation, we're going to tell you a little bit about the history of the Ayers too. But this is Sophia and I in the museum downstairs, which I hope you're going to go and see the exhibition on. So just close up of our books there. Um, I wanted to mention something else. I always get asked the question that how come the Ayers, who were brown women, women that look like me and Sita, how come they lived here such a long time ago? Um, and I just want to give you some a little bit of background about how Indian people, people from South Asia, were living in this country. So does anybody know who this lady is here? Very good, Queen Elizabeth the First. And when was she queen? In the Victorian era. Upper Victoria, Elizabethan, Elizabethan, No? A long time ago, about 400 years ago. Shall we just go with that? Yeah. Uh, so when she when she was the queen, um, what she did was she sent some of her merchants uh, on a ship to India, um, uh, so that uh, they could buy and sell goods for the people living in India. Um, and that was just a, a, a buying goods, buying and selling arrangement, which later turned into the British Empire. Do you know what the British Empire is? Do you want to tell me? Uh, the British Empire. No, the I think it's when like, Britain. Where are Good. I forgot. Okay. Do you want to add? Very good. When, when Britain took over many countries. So Britain took over India. And so because of this relationship with India, they ruled India. Lots of people from India came back and forth to this country. They saw England as the mother country, if you like. And it would only take about three weeks on a ship to travel to India, just before the aeroplanes. Um, so lots and lots of people would go back and forth. And that's how the Ayers came, because um, lots of people were coming to this country and lots of people were going there as well. So it's a good relationship, well, <laughs> uh, relations between the two countries. 
So my, I'm very attached to this story, and I think there are many people today who may be listening to this as well, who may, like my father came on a long ship journey from India to this country to be a doctor in 1959. Whose parents or grandparents or great-grandparents came to this country on a long journey, either by ship or plane? Oh, lots of people putting their hands up. And not just from India, from the Caribbean, from Africa, from many, many countries. My father was actually called to come to this country to be a doctor in the National Health Service in 1959. Would you like to meet me there? I'm going to step into his shoes because when you're a writer, that's what you have to do. And that's what Sophia and I have done. With all our hearts and with all our empathy, we have stepped into the stories of the iron. But my kind of interest was ignited by my dad's talking about his long ship journey to this country. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dr. A.K. Brahmachari and I am Sita's father. I came on a long ship journey from India to be a doctor in the National Health Service. We were called to the motherland because that is what we thought of it. And to be serving the National Health Service. And in Sita's book, when Secret Set Sail, she has placed a doctor and a doctor's surgery in the 1960s in that house. Really, she has got her inspirations from my stories. Who has people in their family who tell them stories about their histories, their cultures and their backgrounds and makes them just want to lean in and listen to those stories? Wow, so many people have got their hands up. Well, this is what happened to us, isn't it, with our Aya stories. We just became completely involved in hearing about these women and what happened to them. Let's tell you a little bit about what happened to them and the passports. So um, the Ayas travelled on passports that look like this. It says British Indian passport, the Indian Empire. Does it look like our passports now? Does it? Who's got a passport here? Who's got their own one? Yeah. What colour is it? Black. 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 Um, so it says British Indian passport, Indian Empire, and um, they also came on other documents. Do you know what you mean? Yeah. So, so what was interesting is what I was very connected to. Who has somebody that's looked after them, either a parent or a carer from when they were little, or a social worker? Okay. So what I was really fascinated with the Aya story is they would come on this long ship journey. And they would look after these children who were the children of the British during the Raj, who, and the children loved them, and they loved the children, as you do when you really look after people when they're babies. And they would come to this country on this ship journey and come to these houses and bring the children. And then sometimes the people who, who were the parents of the children used to send them away, and they wouldn't give them a passport or their passage home. They wouldn't pay for their passage home. In my story, I don't want to blow the story because I'd love you to read it till the end, but in my story, something happens to the Ayah where her do travel documents get destroyed. Who can think of, of what has happened re in recent history where people who are British citizens have had their documents destroyed? And it's not from India, it's from an another Commonwealth country. Yeah. Um, There's a statue outside this very library, which has recently gone out. Yeah. Um, when me and my dad went to Belgium, this lit, well, her document wasn't destroyed, but because she was black, oh, the white person that said that her documents weren't right and they weren't the documents, so she couldn't travel home to England. So look at this story. You can see why Sophia and I have been very connected to this story because it's, it isn't just a story of eyes in the past, but these stories are kind of happening in contemporary history. In my story, the Windrush story is connected to the stories of the eyes because the children of today are thinking, wow, this is happening now, this injustice, but it also happened to the eyes. What should you definitely have? On your travel documents, what should everybody definitely have on their travel documents? Yes. On um, their address. Their address. Okay, that's good. Yes. Their name. Brilliant. Their name. Now you haven't got supersonic vision here. Uh, I certainly haven't. I have to wear my glasses. But I can tell you, on this travel document here, there is no name for the R. 
it, it's all it says is Anthony Fire. And Anthony is the family whose children she brought to Britain. Um, and I saw this picture and it got my imagination. Who thinks they've got a random imagination here? But I saw this picture and suddenly I connected that woman who doesn't have a name to my character, Lucky and Lakshmi, in my story. And I suddenly, every time I read my story, I thought of her. And my intent was to give her her rightful place in history that often women aren't given. They just disappear. Yeah. So, in um, when secrets set sail, the children have to go on a treasure hunt, and they have to go to the places where the Ayer once lived. I don't want to do a plot spoiler because I know you're reading it at the moment. But even though the Ayers, their story was never told. It was like Queen Victoria's stories told. Queen Elizabeth's story is told. The story of the people from empire haven't really been properly told and their contribution to this country. But the children in the story can, if they look very carefully, find evidence of all of our ancestors in paintings and things like this. And so here is a painting by Joshua Reynolds of one of the Ayers and some of the children that she might look after. When I look at this painting, I was thinking about what it must have been like to be an Ayer coming all that way to a different country and then being and then sort of being away from her own family and friends and looking after these other children. And then what would it have been like if that Ayer had been cast out of the house and left to roam amongst the streets on her own without the passage paid for home? And uh, this is the um, front of the Ayers home taken a uh, long time ago. Can you see the Ayers there? Yeah. In their white family, some of them are in black. Uh, and this is the inside the Ayers home. So, this is a doll that I was given by my Auntie Mira when I was your age. And she can't move, she's on my back. Oh, and actually, I found her a little bit worrying when I was a child, because you know when you're little and you move the dolls around and you get them to talk, and you know, boys can do that too with different characters, you know. And I couldn't really move her. And she actually got into my dreams, and I used to imagine her, like what her voice would be like. When I saw these pictures, inside the Ayers home, up the road from you in Hackney, up Mare Street, turn left, you can go to that house and see it. When I saw these pictures inside this house, my random imagination started to go and I started to think about my dog. And look. I have them I put them together. And that is what we do when we tell stories. So we thought we would read you a little bit of our stories. I'll tell it. I'll go first. Yeah. I'll put the book here. Um, so so my book is Searching for Jamila, it's about a uh, young Jamila who's come with her boards and uh, the three children that she looks after who are called Alex, Matt and Lizzie and um, the story starts with her arriving in England, um, staying one night in their home, and the next day being asked to leave. Um, and the scene I'm going to read to you from is, um, well, uh, the day after she's arrived and she has to leave the house, she finds herself abandoned um, in the streets of London. Who would feel quite awful if they were abandoned in the streets of London? So we can all relate to that. So let's have a look at how uh, Jamila is feeling. And um, Jamila has this shawl, she it out, I'll just put it on. Um, she's wrapped herself around this shawl to uh, try and keep warm. Jamila pulled her shawl tightly around her shoulders as she walked on the cobbled stones. It was dark now and a chill had set in. She had been walking all day and the streets of London were not how she had imagined them at all. The big nice houses on Old Clover Road soon gave way to grey and cramped ones on overcrowded streets. To Jamila's relief, nobody paid her the slightest bit of attention as she passed them in her sari and sandals, clutching her duffel bag. Every now and then, Jamila checked the secret pocket in her underskirt. 
that passport was hidden. On this day of her life, it was her most valuable possession. She knew she wouldn't be able to travel home without it. An hour or so later, glancing around, Jamila's big brown eyes filled with fear as she noticed there were fewer women and children out there. She swallowed hard, determined not to break down in tears. She didn't have the luxury. She needed to find a solution to her problem. She needed to focus on reaching her destination after being thrown out, thrown out of the Curtis household. Suddenly, someone in a hurry banged into her and she let out a frightened scream. Turning on her heel, she raced away as fast as she could, unsure which way she was heading. When she could run no more, she dropped at her duffel bag and bent over, clutching her knees for support. Slowly, her breathing steadied and the stitch in her side subsided. Straightening up, Jamila looked around. She was standing in a one-way street that didn't lead anywhere else. The other end was blocked by a high wall by which an old woman sat huddled on the ground on the bench of fire. The old woman had a scarf tied around her head and was wrapped in two shawls. Jamila hurried towards her. Perhaps she would take pity on the homeless lost girl. Hello, Jamila said tentatively. May I share your fire? The more the merrier, girlie, the old woman said to the feeling of missing front tooth. Jamila dropped down onto her pavement and felt the coals were looking thin fabric of her sari. She shifted closer to the crate burning with wood, hoping the orange red flames would warm her. It hadn't been so chilly in the daytime, but the warmth had disappeared along with the sun. Reaching into her duffel bag, she pulled out two little packets of peanuts. She always carried snacks for the children. Well, she wasn't ever going to see them again, so she might as well just eat them to nourish herself. Jamila held out a packet to the old woman. For you. Thank you, dearie. They both munched their peanuts. You alone? The old woman asked. Jamila nodded. The streets are no place for young things like you. Jamila didn't say anything. She cushioned the duffel bag behind her back and curled up into a tight ball. The darkness soon crept up, and the only light in the street came from the flames. Closing her eyes, Jamila swallowed the lump that formed in her throat. The old woman's kindness had reminded her of Ami, her mother. Ami had begged her not to take the job, but Mem Sab had offered it, but Jamila hadn't listened. Ami, she declared, it will be an adventure. How many girls from Bombay get the opportunity to travel to England? That magical land of green hills and the school. Only the Sahel describes this country like that. All the Indians who have visited England speak of a cold place full of factories, workhouses, and hardship. I refuse to believe it, Jamila insisted. Think of the money, it will come in handy now that Papa is gone. Jamila's army had granted permission. There was no doubt that the money would come in handy with raising the two younger daughters now that she was a widow. Jamila's heart was heavy at the thought of returning to India without her wages. She should have demanded the money up front from Curtis' side. Her failure to do so had now left her penniless. So that's the end of that chapter. Um, and I'm just going to do a short reading from when uh, Jamila um, is taken to the house so that people have um, seen this chapter. So Jamila has made her way to the east end of London, to the docks where all the ships are kept, and she's trying to get a ticket home, but she doesn't have any money. Um, and this is what happens. Jamila decided that it was safer to remain at the port than to leave for an unknown location. Her mummy had, her Ami had always warned her about being safe, and one lesson was not to go off with strangers, no matter how kind they were. Thankfully, Azad accepted her refusal with a shrug. He returned a few minutes later with a chunk of bread. He took it gratefully and chewed. I will see you later today, as Azad said. Don't move, I want to introduce you to someone who can help. She nodded her mouth full. The hours passed, and Jamila watched the steamship prepare for its departure. The steam chucked out of its chimney and the horn hooted. When it finally glided away for America, a smaller ship took its place. Lush girls walking on their port ran forward to unload the heavy crates and boxes. She wondered where this small ship had sailed from. The Empire covered one fifth of the earth, and she knew who had arrived in England for all these parties. It was late afternoon when the side returned. This time with a middle-aged Indian lady in tow who was dressed in a white salary and a blue cardigan. Hope rose in uh, Jamila's chest. Perhaps this lady could help her board a ship. Jamila, this is Asha, as I've introduced. She is from the Ayers home. It's a place where abandoned Ayers are given shelter. 
nice to meet you, Julia. So maybe. You don't want to go back into London City, Julia. I want you to board the ship to India. Who will get you home? I should say. The summer holidays are coming to an end, and families will be travelling back to their jobs in India. And come to the home to employ you, so you'll be snapped up. Julia is still reluctant to be in the port. Can't I wait here, Julia? said. Under the stars, you would have You've been very lucky that no one has come to you so far. Come with me, and I promise that we will find a family for you this Tuesday. It was evening by the time Asha stopped outside number four at the end of the road. It had taken them an hour and a half with two buses to see the gentleman of the dog to win their games at the house. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Amazing to read, um, to listen to that story, um, and to think about some of the themes and ideas that are in both of our stories. And we bought a suitcase. Many of our families, including I've got my dad's suitcase. My brother has my dad's suitcase um, that he arrived on his ship journey to England. It says Dr. A. K. Brahmachari on the front of it. So suitcases are amazing things for stories. My dad used to tell me stories, and he had some things in his suitcase that he brought from India in 1959. And as a child, I was so fascinated to hear his stories. We've placed some objects from our stories in this suitcase. And, um, and, and Sophia has shown you the shawl. Um, and there's also, I'll give, give that to this is both of us, there is also a banner that, I don't know if you've got to this bit in When Secrets Set Sail yet, but when Intias, who is being adopted by the family in that house in Hackney, is outside the house, there is a protest, and it's against the refugee centre that in today's time, in my imagination, is at the bottom of the house. And there are some injustices that happen in both of our stories that I think are really important part of us wanting to tell our stories today. And I thought it'd be really interesting to ask somebody here, why do you think it's important to know the stories that happened like in the past to our ancestors? Oh, fantastic. Yes. What do you, what would you say? Um, so you can retell them to other people. That's so brilliant. So you can retell them in our generation to other people because they're not like this dead thing in the past, are they? They are they're live in our family history. Yes. Yes. Um, to learn new things about history and like, try and make things like right if things are still not good. That is so wonderful to learn new things, to learn new things about history, but also to think about the legacies of the waves of history and what isn't right now. To maybe rethink the way that we, our generation, thinks about things. Yeah. Um, to maybe like understand, like to understand um, like the different views of other people because um, maybe you might have a good life but you never know because um, like you, you might judge the person just because they're on the streets but you don't know how they got there, why they got there um, and it's just really important to know that, to know that um, Kindness goes a long way because, like, if you a tiny bit of breath, even if you're poor yourself. What a wonderful answer, isn't it? I think Randall talking about it. Because you're really talking about kindness and empathy. So even though our stories are about the ayahs and home, home, being homeless at that time, it might spark your, I, I passed a homeless person today and I felt, oh goodness, what was their story? So it's sparking your empathy. And I think Sophia and I's stories are hopefully will really speak into empathy. Okay, um, yes? To fix our mistakes and make sure we don't do it again. To fix our mistakes and make sure we don't do it again. I came to Hackney this morning and looked up at that beautiful, beautiful statue in commemoration of the wonderful people in Hackney, the Windrush generation, who uh, Delis is connected to. So it's not just about, you know, it's also about how we connect from the stories of empire that I think Sophia and I are quite interested in telling. The Ayas are not only Indian women, but they were from all over the empire, so Mauritius and China and those other countries. Okay, so I would like to um, have a volunteer, please. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Would you like to? No, you. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to come up? Okay. And as I am reading, 
get my glasses on, my bit of the story, I would like you to be in tears. Is that okay? And so, I, do you know what I think? I think I'd like you to take out the suitcase. Yes. So if you stay there, because you're the most important, and I'm just going to do the reading. Okay. Passing the conch shell. Buyer's home. <clears throat> Swinging around the edge of the railings, Intias and Usha were too out of breath to speak, but both held the same photograph in their minds, eyes of the ayahs standing right here on their doorstep. Once inside, Lucky headed straight for the hellhole, placing a finger over her mouth and ushering them to follow her. Light fell into slanted shafts through the cracks from the staircase floorboards above. What are we doing here? Usha asked, confused. Following Lucky. Imtias clicked on the phone's torch, shining it deep under the stairs where Lucky was now crawling between the tandem pedals towards the back of the cupboard, beckoning for Imtias to follow her. Usha closed the door quietly behind them while Imtias observed Lucky's concentrated expression as she traced her hands over the plasterwork. What are you trying to tell us? Imtias whispered. Is there something behind here? As she tugged the tandem backwards to get by, it scraped against the wall, once again loosening a cascade of powder dust as it crumbled. There's something around here she wants us to see, Imtias whispered as the girls froze, stilling their breath momentarily at the sound of Lem and Tandy's voices in the hall. Cram seized Usha's foot as she shifted slightly, her jacket buckled caught on the back wheel of the tandem, and as she unhooked it, the spokes began to skim. Swinging round to stop the whirring sound, Imtias dislodged the handlebars of another bike that came crashing down towards her. Imtias clung to the wall, her fingers finding the frayed edges of exposed wallpaper that came away in her hands. She shone the torch on it, brushing off the powdery surface. Usha's nose itched and she attempted to muffle a sneeze. Usha, Imtias whispered. This is the same pattern that was in the photo of the ayah sitting at the table. It must have been all over this house. It's like Lucky wants to prove to us that everything we touch here, even behind the paperwork, is part of our story. Intias let out an explosive sneeze and began coughing and spluttering. What on earth? Light blasted into the cupboard as Lem peered inside and Usha watched the plaster dust curl into the light and spiral up the surface. Whatever are you doing in here? I thought you were in the library. I should have that first. We were, but we wanted to have another look at the tandem and the door closed behind us. She just climbed out, brushing the dust from her face. You two look like ghosts, Len joked. Go and clean yourself up and get some fresh air. While you are out, I set up a tent for you to camp out tonight. We'll bring you up some pizzas later. How does that sound? Great, thanks, they chorused, racing upstairs. Usher headed straight over to Kalima and breathing a sigh of relief to see her propped up on her pillows, took the photo out of her pocket to show her while Imtias grabbed the conch. I'm going out to the tent with Lucky. Ask your Kalima to come too. Bring her promise book, the photos. We've got to piece together everything now. Out on the top deck, Imtias crawled into the tent, which had been decked out in bright coloured cushions and a patchwork quilt. Lucky sat opposite her, cross-legged. Imtias nodded as Lucky pointed to the woman next to her. Are you the Mina and the Gladys that we ta they talked about in the library? Imtias asked. The woman smiled and inclined her head as Lucky's two other friends settled around the edges of the tent, as if they were witnesses of the story of the job. Imtias locked eyes with Lucky as she listened to the conch. There was no doubt about it. Through the surge and surf of waves and Lucky's sweet lullaby, her voice was becoming clearer and growing in strength. Your belief in me sets my voice free. Promise to peace me together, or my story's lost forever. To find peace in this house, so my patchwork of forgotten promises, pomegranate pieces, bargains broken, secrets unspoken, free my story to free this house, 
say in my memory, set my spirit free. Breath out. In chest, listen close to the whispering waves. Please let there be more, she will. Find my calling heart to open hearts. Two lines before looping back to Lucky's lilting lullaby. Your belief in me sets my voice free. Promise to peace me together, or my stories lost forever. MTS, is this? Can you put the cross to your ear? Can you hear anything? No. What's blocking it? What inside? What is it? What is it? Ooh. It grows. It looks like a handkerchief. <laughs> oh no, not a dirty old handkerchief. What is it though? It's a cloth. It's got the name Lucky and a pomegranate. It's a clue. And in our stories, the children of today have to piece together. It's not a handkerchief, it's a... What is it? A sari! She's got missing pieces of her sari that she's left in the places where her story is written. And it's up to you, the children of today, to read Sophia and my story and piece together this moment in history and how it connects today. I think we should give a round of applause to India. So here are just three things that connect to today in the story. So when you're reading this story, you're reading Imtias's story in When Secrets Set Sail, you're reading, uh, you're reading Usha's story and her ancestor's story, you're also reading the story of the Windrush generation because they are connected to Imtias. Imtias's family are from the Caribbean and South Asia. And they're, so they're all connected together. So we invite you to think about today's day at times as well. Go to the next one. Start your quest and read Searching for Jamila and When Secrets Set Sail. Who knows where it will lead you on your own historical story trail to explore the histories of your own families too. <laughs> Sophia. So this is me and uh, um, Sita outside the Ayers home. Um, do we all know what, do we, have you ever seen blue plaques outside houses? Yeah. Yeah. I think we might have quite a few in this area in Hackney. Can anyone tell me, have they seen any, who they represent? Um, they usually represent people, famous people or special people. Yeah, famous people or People we want to remember in our history. Um, so, any that you've noticed? Names? Um, so that's the one outside our school. Yeah. Is that what they do? Do you know the name of the person? Um, no, but Ow. I thought it was the fastest um, girl. No, fastest girl that grew bison racing car. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. oh, yeah. there aren't many for women. Yeah. So that's great. <laughs> First plastic. Wow. Well, that's an interesting one, isn't it? We take plastic today. Yeah. Take one last one there. I think there's one next to the entrance of the entrance of our school. The house I think is to be a office for police, but I'm not sure. It's quite intriguing, isn't it, when you see it? Uh, what I really like about the Ayers plaque, you can see that Sophia and I were actually there at the opening of the Ayers, because do you know the actress Mira Sia? 
You might have seen her. She was in, uh, goodness gracious me, she wrote a story called Anita and Me. She's quite, you might, you could go and look her up, go and Google her, her Mira Sial, you'll know who she is. She opened it with another very fantastic uh, porter and writer called Anita Adam, just a few weeks ago. Yeah. We, we were so excited to be there, we didn't even wait for the ladder to be moved. We <laughs> liked the ladder. <laughs> because you know, they just put it up and we were like, well, we thought the ladder's like you, you're like climbing the ladder of history to find out how to put these women in the past. So it's like that's what we've kind of tried to do with our books, haven't we? We've kind of tried to get a ladder from today back into the past and then back to the present again. Yeah. yeah. So you can go and see it. And guess look at look at this window here. You can see the shadow. You know, if you look at my book, you can see there's a shadow in one of the windows of the spirit. And if you look at this one, which was really happening when we were there, there was a parent and their child inside the house looking out of the window. And then they came out and they were asking the history of the house. Like people should know the history of the house that they're living in, not just the house, but the land that they're living in and going back and back. So for me, that was an amazing metaphor. And then here's a picture of the fantastic exhibition That's downstairs. So cool. um, I think it's close to me. No, we're going to go downstairs afterwards. Okay. Okay. They're going to be this for us. We're going to walk through together. This suitcase came from the exhibition. So you'll get to see that. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, Sophia and I are both writers, work writing for you today. We are very proud to write for your generation. Um, it's like a real privilege to hear your answers and your questions. And I know that some of you had a few questions that you were very brave in a way that I wouldn't have been, and you're going to come up and ask. So for the people who said that they were going to ask questions who came up before, could you just come up here and ask us your questions? Yes. Thank you. Very great of you. Well done. And, and you can. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so, fire away. <laughs> so, Lisa, how did you feel when you were writing your book? I felt very, very good question. I felt very emotional when I was writing my book because, as you can see in my story, like it goes back through history to pre Victorian times, and in the bottom of that, that house is really my like, dad's doctor's surgery. He came to, and also the refugee centre that I work in today is also in the heart and the bottom of that book. So, like, you know, when we write, we do write about things that we really care about in the world today as well as in history. So, I felt very emotional. How did you feel? Emotional, too? Yeah. I think also I just want to add to that question that when I'm writing these stories, uh, what I'm hoping is that when the read reads it, uh, you feel a sense of belonging as well to this country. Because seeing people that look like you in the book helps you feel like you belong to. Yeah. Who would agree that when they see people like themselves in the book, it makes them feel like, oh, I'm part of this British history too. Fantastic. So there's a little bit of that as well. I think it's really important for us to feel connected to the history, no matter where we what we look like. Uh, we're all British. Um, you know, like I said, in that Queen Elizabeth's first slide that we showed, there's 400 years of history. Um, and there's so many more stories that need to be told, not just by the but loads of other ones as well. Maybe you guys too. And they, we hope, we hope to inspire you. And also how the stories connect. I'm really interested to know like how the stories of Windrush connects to the Aya story that connects to the refugee people seeking asylum today. I'm very interested in those connections, piecing ourselves together. Fantastic. Thank you. you can come to that. Yes, why would you? Why did you choose to write about Iris? No. <laughs> yeah. um, again, because um, it's part, they were part of our British history. So um, I think there are lots of parts of our British history that people just don't know about. Um, it's hidden history, and I think we should make it shared history. Um, so I think it's important to remember the people that we've lived with them. Uh, the contributions that they made to the world. Um, so it's really things like that. Uh, that they were here, um, they did something, we should remember this. You know, they should be forgotten. Yeah, even though, you know, sometimes we face emphasis on only the famous people. Yes. There are other people as well. I really like that about the plaque for the house, that it's not just about an individual. A lot of the world is about, oh, I am, you know, I, this is about my achievements and all of that. But actually, the Ayas had many achievements and they were we, they were a community. And so it's not just for one person, it's for all of the Ayas. 
and I think that's really important. But I remember why I wrote my story. That I was working with an old lady who had dementia. You might know that when people have dementia, they lose their memory. Sometimes they can remember what they had for breakfast, but not what they had for you know, They can remember what happened to them a long time ago, but not what they had for breakfast. And this lady was in a care home, and um, I was talking to some of the members there, and this lady said, See, tell the story of the ayahs. Nobody tells the story of the working class women of empire. And that stayed in my mind all the time, and I randomly connected it to my door. And that's when I started finding out. It's like a treasure hunt. Thank you. Very lovely question. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good question. That's a good question. Why did the people not pay the nannies after the trip? Mm. Well, in my story, and I think it opens a bit of a people get a call to so just a little bit. And it was a case of what they thought they could get away with. So, and I was pretty much on her own. My family was here, my family in India. And it's really, really easy. I think it was just a case of bullying. Because it's a form of bullying when you're speaking to somebody else. Because you can get away with it. That's what bullies do, don't they? They mean because they think they can get away with it because they feel they're more powerful. And so I think that's why they didn't pay her because they could get away with it and get away as well on their own. Um, but the whole point of the Ayers Home is that when they got together collectively, they had a little bit more power. And the people that took the Ayers into that home were missionaries. And uh, they were Christian missionaries. And they didn't think it was right that these islands should be on the streets. But it was a very different time and there wasn't so much respect for people's individual religions and cultures. And the missionaries often tried to convert them to Christianity, although they had their own uh, history. You can see that in both of our stories. Um, but one of the things that I think was particularly mean about abandoning the islands was also for the children that you were loved them. And I think that's why it's such a good children's story and young people's story today is because we cared for the ayahs, but we also thought about the poor children who had seen these ayahs almost like their mothers and suddenly they didn't have them anymore. So in my book, Matt, Matt Alex and Lizzie um, ignore their grandmother who has thrown Jamila out and they go all over London searching for her uh, because they miss her, they want to know that she's alive um, and they want to ask her to come back. And, you know, and, and in my story, there are people who have, have been traumatised by kind of losing their iron are still kind of whispering to people today to say, please tell the story of what happened to my iron. Because it's like unresolved history and the, and the house won't be settled until this story is released. Brilliant questions. Um, I don't know how much time we've got. Are we OK for time? Yeah? Yeah? Well, here we yeah. go, 10 minutes. <laughs> What inspired us to write our books? Okay, I brought my books, my notebook. I hope everybody will be inspired to write, like Usha, their own summer holiday journal. This summer holiday, back from summer holidays. In my book, I have pieces of the history, my own history, the IS history, colonial history, empire history, that I have been piecing together since I was younger than you. These are letters that I sent to my cousin in India, asking her what it was like when my mum and dad got married and my father didn't go back to India. I was very interested in the stories of my family when I was your age. And I didn't realise what Sophia said about belonging. I didn't ever believe that I would be a published writer. And I'm quite old now, and I didn't write my first book till I was 40. I didn't have the confidence that stories about people like my family but I didn't find them in books or in libraries. And, but I was already writing my own books. So I think Sophia and I have like a code and a mission in our stories is to get you to go, oh, that's Sophia Ahmed wrote that story. Oh, that's Sophia Ahmed wrote that story. I could write that story. It's not the same history. But I could piece together the story of my own history and tell other people. Maybe we could all do that for some other day. I think I think for you to believe that your your story is just as important as all the other stories. So important. Yeah. So important. Piece together your history, and then it somehow it helps you. And doodle and daydream. That's how I start all my stories by doodling and daydream. And you can transform difficult things into good things by storytelling. Can't you? It's really it's really fantastic to do. Thank you very Whatever much. Whatever goes off in your imagination, write it down. Have a notebook. <laughs> Oh, that's a really good question. Um, they, the Ayas weren't only Indian, they were from over the, the Empire. Empire. 
And you mentioned Luskers as well, you mentioned sailors as well. So it wasn't just women, they were working class men as well. Yes, so Luskers are uh, sailors, the men given to Indian sailors who worked on all the ships that moved back and forth all over the empire region. And uh, they were very, very popular in the sense that they were, you know, uh, given jobs. Because they were paid less than the English sailors. Um, and also, if the captain decided that they didn't want them on the, you know, uh, on the, uh, on the sail back home or to another country, they would just abandon them as well. So the Lushkas were pretty much treated the same as the IS in the sense that they were bullied and they didn't have that many rights. Um, but I was really interested in the fact that Hackney was the, yes, always been the place of so many mixed heritage people, so especially working class people. So there are a lot of mixed marriages way, 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 way back. And Hackney was a place where there were a lot of mixed marriages. So, so Laskers would marry working class English women. Um, and it happens, in, it happens in your book and it's part of the stories, the friendship between Gladys, who was a cleaner in the house, and and um, lucky in my story, relationships between there was a lady in your street that connected a Hackney lady. So it's a relationships between working class people in history that you hardly often, hardly ever get. You usually get the queens or the kings, don't you? Yeah, fantastic. Well, you have communities all living together. Mm. Okay, so this one is from why did you feel the Oh, the title of the book went secret set sale. Um, because I was thinking about what happens when the truth gets told. Because I think, you know, we're living in a time where sometimes it's difficult to find what the truth of the matter is. Sometimes people say things and you think, I think I would like the children of today to look into whether that's the truth or not of what they tell. And so I thought when Secret Set Sail was a really good title because it's an adventure story like Sophia's. It's about inviting young people to look behind the stories that aren't told and to find the truth of the history. And so secrets, I think, are quite interesting. Like if you've got a random imagination, you can think, you know when someone says to you, don't do something, what happens? You want to do it. Do not read that book by Peter Brahmachari. That's a very, very good word. You go, okay, you know what? Why does it why don't they want me to do it? Maybe so I thought they would be an intriguing title for the book. And it set sail because in my imagination, the top of the house is not just a house, but it's a ship. And the children today are sailing forward with the knowledge of these journeys. Yeah. Good good question. Yeah. Um, when you were on the step of the how did you did you like feel the presence of them? <laughs> we, 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 we were we were like goosebumps, yeah. weren't we? <laughs> we were like we, we, it was so funny because um it was just such a it was quite emotional, wasn't it? It was emotional yeah. for everybody. Yes, there. yes. And everybody cared enough about these historical events. Yeah, uh, it, I think they were remembering them and honouring them. Yes. And that they were important to you and that whatever they were to you, you know, it was unjust. Um, but we, we can remember their stories. I think what Sophia was saying about journeys of belonging and journeys of hope, that in the end, we did this thing where we, we made up this story out of our imaginations and piecing together history, and then to actually be there in the real world and have them remembered, and so standing there with our little contribution was was just really special. I think yeah. if you all go along outside, you yeah. might be there as well because you're reading the book anyway. You're in that world. Um, to stand there, you might get that. And I really think about the children who live inside that house, not to know their history, really, really worried me. Yeah, um, and so they do know the history. In fact, I think we should go and post the books through the letterbox of the house. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And the last one. Um, what has the favourite that we've written? Yeah. Oh, it's such a what has our favourite book that we've written so far been? It's such a hard question to answer. Um, yes, you go first, Sophia. Uh, I've had a few, but I think my favourite one is uh, a World War II story that I've written about a real nice spy called Nori Nayakong, uh, who was sent to France uh, to collect secret information about the Nazis, send them back a uh, secret code back to London to help us with the war. So that's my one, it's called Nori Nayakong, a World War II spy heroine. There was also South Asian 
and is linked again to all that British Empire history. Uh, people from all, you know, all the empire, all those different countries which have come to England, felt this was the mother country um, and they contributed in their own way. Well, it's very hard to say what your favourite book is because when you're writing a book, as Sophia will feel, you're completely overwhelmed with that book and that's all you care about. You're not really interested in anything else but that book. So usually when I finish the book, then I get a new obsession with a new book. But the book that changed my life was a book called Artichoke Car, which is my first book and our lovely agent. Sophia and I have the same agent and agents are really important. That's Sophie, she's our agent. And um, agents are really important because they help to take, they get your story and then they give your story to publishers and they say, would you like this story? And Sophie sent my first story, Artichoke Cart, out to publishers. And I was still the very shy person that didn't think anyone would want my stories. And then my stories got published because of that. And that story has, it's, it's three stories, it's a family story, Artichoke Cart, Jasmine's Guys and Tender Earth. And the characters in it are mixed heritage family. Um, and they're a little bit like my own family. Not only the family that I came from, but the children that I had growing up. And I wanted to write stories for my children and you that were more representative of who we are, which I never saw when I was little. It's about a grandmother who gives her granddaughter a charm, a grandson a charm, and she says, carry this with you. And in a way, I think, Sophia and I, the reason why we've really enjoyed doing this together is because I think in our books, we're kind of handing you a bit of a charm which has a superpower for you to take forward and to be this teller of your own stories too. Good question. Okay. I think we're going to have to finish now. Yeah. And go and have a look at the museum. Yes, we're going to have a look at the museum. And as um, Sabina said, we'll send you the books once we get them. And we've got these, I don't know whether you're going to give them afterwards, so we'll show them to them. Yes, to the, shall, shall we come down to the museum? And then do that, yeah. And then have to hand out some leaflets for you. Yeah, yeah so the museum has a lovely exhibition about yeah. the areas of stories in Hackney. And they are opening just for us today. So it's closed for everybody, but we can go in. Um, so you want to up, and it's a bit cool, it does this. And we can take some photographs. We can take some photographs, yes, definitely, yeah.